from Boston, Massachusetts and Real Endo headquarters, I'm Ali Nasir with another presentation. I'm joined today by Dr. Joe Iwanaga, Assistant Professor in the Department of Anatomy at Kurumi University School of Medicine in Kurumi, Japan. Dr. Iwanaga is an oral and maxillofacial surgeon and a clinical anatomist in Japan. His research and surgical focus is on anatomical variations and microsurgical anatomy. Currently, he lives in Seattle, Washington, working as a research fellow at the Seattle Science Foundation, where he joins us from uh, today. Dr. Iwanaga, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Dr. Iwanaga, I recently heard you present at our school at HSTM, and I asked you to put together a short excerpt of your presentation to share with our global audience. You kindly prepared this presentation titled Quick Review of Significant Mandibular Anatomy for the Endodontic Surgeon. So I will share that with our audience today. And as you know, I'm a big fan of anatomy and taught head on neck anatomy at our school for a number of years. Uh, what I have seen in my clinical and educational career is that uh, a thorough understanding of anatomy creates an important foundational knowledge for successful implementation of all future clinical techniques. Anatomy is the basis of all we do. So why don't you please take us through uh, the short presentation on the macroscopic anatomical features of the mandible and what we should know as endodontic surgeons. Please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Nesse. Endodontic treatment and surgery for mandibular teeth always require knowledge of anatomy, especially the mandibular foramen and canal and mental framing are really clinical significant as you have already known. First, I will talk about normal anatomy and then secondly, uh, I will talk about variations. Inferior alveolar nerve, artery and the vein enter the mandibular foramen and then run obliquely downwards forward in the mandibular ramus and the horizontal front in the body. The other important normal anatomy is the diameter of the, each structure of the inside the canal. Although uh, many textbooks describe the artery and the vein has been drawn as if they were the thickest bundle of the canal. The truth is, the nerve is the thickest bundle of the canal. Yeah, that's something that's oftentimes not uh, talked about. People in the drawings uh, make the, uh, the the vascular bundle a little bit thicker than the nerve, but the nerve is thicker. And also, it's significant for the endodontist to know that the nerve is actually in the inferior aspect of the canal, not the superior aspect of the canal. During apical mm -hmm. surgery, you know, that would be uh, of significance to know. Yeah, yeah. So let me talk about variations of uh, mandibular canal. This variation, retromark canal, is considered as a normal variation. Recent study using CBCT showed that retromark canal could be identified in approximately in 40% of the mandible. It contained the nerves which innervate to the buccal gingiva of the lower molar. According to Naito, the retromark canal is one of the subtype of the bifid mandibular canal. This bifid mandibular canal is sometimes considered as the cause of the failure of the mandibular block. However, because of the bifurcation point is inside the canal, it might not be the cause of the block failure. So what is the cause of the block failure? Let's see the terrigal mandibular space. This picture shows the right side of the pterygomandibular space of the cadaver head. Major part of the mandibular ramus has been already removed. Here is the uh, starting from the top, uh, maxillary artery, inferior head of the lateral pterygoid muscle, lingual nerve, inferior alveolar artery and nerve, nerve to the mild hyoid, middle pterygoid muscle. The visceral wall of the inferior alveolar artery has been removed so thinner than their its real thickness but you can see it is still thin and the nerve to the mild higher branch of the inferior alveolar nerve at an average of 13 to 14 millimeter before the latter enter the mandibular foramen so uh, at this moment uh, let's discuss the anatomical cause of the black failure Many studies have described that reason of the failure of the failures are the position of the mandibular foramen, innervation of the nerve to the mild hyoid, and structure of the pterygomandibular space, 
As with many Dan and the Donists, I also agree with the position of the mandibular framing is very important to, for mandibular block. Many studies show the position of the mandibular framing is 6 to 10 millimeters above the occlusal plane. But several papers show that individual differences are not too great to fail the block. So what is another reason? The nerve to the mild hyoid carries sensation from the premolar canine and incisor teeth with the incidence of approximately 60%, although the nerves to the mild hyoid has traditionally has been considered a model nerve. It has been suggested that sensory fibers carried by the nerve supply the skin. The other studies show the nerve to the mild hyoid in the base of the region. As I mentioned earlier, nerve to the mild hyoid is branched from the inferior alveolar nerve at an average of 13 to 14 millimeters before the latter enter the mandibular framing. So if the anesthetic is injected into the mandibular framing very well, it might not work for nerve to the mild hyoid. Do you, do you really think this um, you know, injection into the um, turgomandibular space and around the mandibular foramen, so being the fact that the mylohyoid actually is branches off only about 13 millimeters or so uh, superiorly, um, so you, you think that that's enough if you're giving the injection too low during uh, the mandibular block, correct? And probably why uh, part of the way you can increase your success rate by giving the shot a little bit higher and more posteriorly. Do you think that could be one possible mechanism why that works by giving the shot more posteriorly and superiorly? Um, I think not enough for because uh, average is 13 to 14, but uh, I think uh, there is more higher position or more lower position, so something, some, sometimes it, it, it uh, positioned in uh, 20 millimeters above the framing or more, I don't know, but uh, it is very different from each individual, so I think uh, uh, injection to uh, infiltration anesthesia into the linger plate is very important. Okay, so let me talk about mental framing. All dentists know about this framing, right? Do you know this position of the mental framing? Position of mental framing is different from each study. The CBCT by ARCs show that 56% of the mental framing was located apically between first and second premolars. In contrast, most cadaver studies have showed the common position of the mental framing below the second premolar. Many cadaver studies without bone dissection may in misinterpret mental framing position because of the distally curved roots of the premolars. These are the picture of the mental framing nerve in cadaver head. Look at the bottom left picture. You occasionally see the mental framing nerve like this in clinical situation. Actually, you can see the mental framing but cannot see the mental nerve in this picture because the mental nerve is covered by periosteum and epineurium. As long as you don't cut periosteum, you will not injure nerve. Okay, here is the accessory mental framing, which has become very popular since the CBCT developed. Many studies show the accessory mental framing were predominantly located posterior to the mental framing. However, our previous studies show that the large accessory mental framing were located anterior superior to the mental framing and very close to the mental framing. This table shows the results of the analysis of the accessory mental framing artery and nerve by dissection and CBCT study. But it is not so easy to understand, so let me explain. This shows the relative size location of and the distance from the mental framing, and the different color of circle indicated the neurovascular bundle component. In this study, 20 accessory mental framing was examined, and the largest number of accessory mental framing were identified posterior superior to the mental framing. But please note, most of the large accessory mental framing exist close to the mental framing and anterior superior to the mental framing. 
only in case of big unilaterally accessorimental foramen, we may detect by panoramic radiography because of the difference in size from the contralateral mental foramen. That's our slide I have today, and so let's get into the another slide of question and answers. Yeah, sure. Well, thanks so much for putting these uh, slides together for us to talk about it. Obviously, here we focus primarily on these major foramina, the mental foramen, the accessory mental foramen, the, uh, you know, uh, the retromolar foramen kind of a deal, and the infraalveolar uh, foramen, which is the mandibular foramen, which are the, these big major macroscopic foramina in the mandible that are significant. We didn't really talk about uh, the... Um, pulpal anatomy and tooth morphology, which is obviously a significant part of dental anatomy that is important to endodontists and, and dentists, which probably we're going to cover in a uh, future uh, video and tutorial. But um, I wanted to uh, quickly talk to you about uh, one of the questions that came up about the mental foramen. Uh, you know, as you reflect, I, I do a lot of mandibular surgery during you know, our program at Harvard Postdoc and the program is very strong surgically. We teach a lot of surgery uh, to the residents. Um, we see during mandibular molar surgery, we see a lot of accessory mental foramina. In terms of the decision to, uh, to obviously elevate and then p possibly uh, making the executive decision of whether it should end up being damaged or cut during surgery by reflecting a flap to get access to the apex, my personal clinical experience has been that you don't end up getting paresthesia or any of those things from the small, thin, like one millimeter or smaller accessory, accessory for uh, uh, mental, for, uh, mental nerves and foramina that, that are coming out. Have you found a similar thing in terms of your um, experience uh, surgically with these, uh, uh, in terms of the size of the accessory mental foramen and its consequence on reflecting a flap? This is in my, my understanding, but uh, as you know, as you told me, and uh, less than one millimeter in diameter of the accessory mental foramen, it is not so big. It will be not so big problem if you cut or ligate. My opinion is uh, we should not injure or cut off. If right. we, if we do so, um, I think your patient will be uh, will be get uh, nerve paralysis or numbness. Right. No, obviously, uh, larger uh, bundles will have a significant uh, uh, sensory, uh, you know, contribution to the somatic tissues and so on. So you can't have, uh, uh, you can't damage those. And also in terms of the mental foramen itself and the mental um, bundle, neurovascular bundle that comes out of there, you had a wonderful uh, slide there showing the, the bundle encased in periosteum, which is basically the picture we see clinically when we raise a flap, you end up basically seeing the, uh, uh, the bundle, almost in a sense, luckily being protected in the periosteum. From a surgical point of view, uh, clearly you don't want to cut through that, but also in terms of elevation, it's also significant to make sure that you're not pulling on it, because pulling obviously will pull through the whole, uh, whole bundle and could potentially cause neuropraxis, uh, which will then take uh, you know longer in terms of paresthesia for it to to recover. Another uh, point that you brought up in terms of the positioning of the mandibular foramen um, not being as significant. Has there been anything in the literature to show whether the uh, the mandibular foramen or the accessory innervation through the mylohyoid is more of a contributing factor for um, anesthesia failure? Yeah, uh, many, many, uh, many uh, papers show the result of the position of the mandibular foramen is uh, affected the result of the block failure. So uh, I, I strongly agree with them. Uh, the position of the mandibular foramen is very affected to the block failure. But uh, I don't think it's uh, related with the mental position of mental foramen. So, uh, no, no, obviously not the mental foramen. No, uh, but but I do agree with the, you know, to cover if you have anesthesia failure uh, for a mandibular block, the idea is to aim a little bit higher, more superiorly and posteriorly, so hopefully you get a little bit closer to the branching route. Also, as you mentioned, the addition of ling lingual infiltration would be helpful for mandibular molars to potentially get 
that accessory innovation for through the myelohyoid, and also now using some of the um, uh, newer local anesthetics that have better bone penetration capability, such as articaine and things like that. Buccal infiltration has also been shown to be uh, effective. A combination of buccal infiltration, mandibular block, and so on will help achieve good um, local anesthesia for these very difficult mandibular molars uh, that we're trying to uh, to get. Uh, Private, I I very interested in your personal experience of the block failure. Yeah, I mean, I, I teach the anesthesia, I teach the advanced anesthesia course at the dental school too. So that's, I mean, I have this is an area I'm very interested. In even even well. though you are you sometimes are experience the failure block. Well, if I if I ever experience a block failure, I mean, to just to, to reiterate the issue, a block failure is something that doesn't happen as commonly when uh, when you're doing regular restorative work. Also, it has to do with the extent of uh, anesthesia that's required. Obviously, I always say that anesthesia is a ladder, and the lowest rung of the ladder belongs to some of the basic operative procedures, and then you got surgery, but then even higher than surgery is achieving profound pulpal anesthesia in order to completely anesthetize all the um, uh, the a delta and even the inflamed c fibers in the in the um, in the pulp because as you know you have a whole, whole different physiology going on during an irreversible pulpitis than you have under normal circumstances so all studies show that the success rate drops dramatically when you have a patient that is suffering from irreversible pulpitis compared to a patient that has either regular pulpitis or is, is not inflamed. So uh, anesthesia failure does occur commonly uh, from a conventional block uh, in these cases, and that's why accessory uh, forms of uh, anesthesia, these additional types of infiltrations, buccal and lingual, using these types of newer anesthetics as well as the additional uh, types of um, uh, intraligamental and as well as intraosseous anesthesia comes really helpful and handy in uh, in these types of circumstances. Well, uh, Dr. Iwanaga, I know you're a busy man. Thank you so much for enlightening us uh, today with this presentation. I'm sure we will pay more attention to these anatomical landmarks and their variations during patient care and management moving forward. And uh, thank you again for joining me. Thank you so much. From Seattle, Washington, where is currently research fellow at the Seattle Science Foundation. I was joined today by Dr. Joe Iwanaga, assistant professor in the Department of Anatomy at the uh, Kurumi University School of Medicine in Kurumi, Japan. And from Boston, Massachusetts, and for Reworld Endo, I'm Ali Nese, and I hope you found this information helpful.